So this is something called neuroplasticity, where actually nerve fibers actually keep forming. And each time they form, they are going to do all the chemical reactions and things like that. So more experiments, very funny experiments. Actually, people were told to come and play the piano uh, and do specific chords. That means one, four, three, five. One, four, three, five. So with one finger, they used to do one, four, and three, and five. So they did this for 20 minutes every day, five days a week, so many weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, the area of the brain, which was looking after the fingers, was seen, and it had developed a lot. A second group of patients were told to just watch, and watch and mentally rehearse the 1, 4, 3, 5, 1, 4, 3, 5, 1, 4, 3, 5, and the results were actually equal which means that the brain does not know from what it is actually doing and what it is actually imagining. Now imagine, what is it that you are mentally rehearsing all day? You know? If you're thinking of bad thoughts, you're actually rehearsing those thoughts. If you're thinking of uh, uncomfortable situations, you're actually allowing your nerve fibers to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And as they grow, they, uh, they, they supply all the chemicals, like I said, uh, which, which do all the damage. Um, there are some stories that actually deserve mentioning, and the reason is that these are stories of people who I call exceptional patients, in the sense that they refused to die when they were supposed to die, or they did not get a particular disease uh, when they were supposed to get a disease given the factors that control their lives. So a lot of studies uh, were done, and some of them are my own patients and other patients who sent me and other doctors who sent me these stories. Strangely enough, the commonalities among uh, these patients, uh, you know, number one was ability to express anger. Now, when you're given a grim diagnosis, I believe that anger is a much more positive response as long as it's expressed freely and safely, and much better than bottling it up. And, ang and these are people who actually participate in the illness. These are people who angrily call you when they're not getting well. They're, ang they're angry when you're not treating them with respect or giving them the right attention. Strangely enough, these people survive much more than people who go depressed and go home to die. You know, they, it's very funny. <coughs> there is, was this example of this patient who was always fighting with the doctors and one day she developed breast, breast, breast cancer and they said, Achha, now we have this woman, you know. And so when they opened her up, uh, she had, uh, her, her cancer was in the right breast, and on the left breast, she had put a big marker sign saying, not this one, stupid. You know, so even, <laughs> and she did so well. She developed metastatic disease, but she continued to do well because of these expressions of anger. And there are many stories which tell us that how healing has taken place through these expressions of anger. There was this woman who had cancer of the cervix. And after treatment, there was a time when she was very angry with the doctors, with the side effects and things like that. And she started to show her anger about how she was abused as a child and how her parents didn't do anything. And she expressed her anger to such an extent that she was drained. From the next day, her healing started. You know, you've seen this with breaking up of marriages. You've seen this with picking up jobs. There was another very interesting story about a guy who had uh, autoimmune disease. And again, you know, he um, uh, was in this situation where he was desperate with the side effects and he felt this sudden rage with his, his dependency on the drugs and with the doctors and with the medicine com medical community. And he described it as something that sort of took over his body. And again, through these expressions of anger, he actually got uh, better. Then there's stories of hope, optimism, joy. Like there was this, uh, there's this woman who had this very untreatable sort of cancer, and she told her daughter, it was summer, that I want to buy a fur coat. And she was very, you know, uh, difficult about her expenses, so the daughter was very, you know, surprised, could be a fur coat, you know, What she was saying, that am I going to survive till winter? And so she was given a fur coat. So that, you know, that hope, that hope went up, and she actually survived. And then, you know, you see these people who have this will to live, or people who actually, you know, we always say, I'm going to fight this thing because we promote this in our patients, you know. We have medical arsenal, we're going to attack this bacteria, we're going to blow this guy down or whatever. So people actually who take this defensive stance against disease do well for a while, but actually they don't do well in the long run. 
And those people who go into this acceptance, you know, and this acceptance is an acceptance at a very different level of the at the acceptance of a greater self inside, and, and that motivates uh, uh, the healing. And often it's 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 uh, it's due to uh, uh, you know some people with a spiritual experience. So this Japanese fellow who wasn't told he had cancer, you know, they went through tests, they went through treatment, and one day he realized what was wrong with him, and he he, he realized he was going to die, and he said, "I want to go away," and he went up to the roof of the hospital and people thought he was going to sort of jump and kill himself. So the doctors told him, if you're going to behave like this, you know, we're going to send you home. He said, okay, send me home. So he goes home, he goes to his terrace and he sits there and waits for the sun to rise. And when the sun comes out, you know, he believes the sun is coming inside him and, 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 he, in, and he connected with his God and, um, you know, uh, he became well. And there are these people who, 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 who embrace that spiritual level who, go, who get well. Uh, and they, they say one very common thing. They say that we felt an existential shift in our lives. When I was given, handed over this diagnosis of cancer, I felt my body shifting, my mind shifting, my focus shifting. And I started living for the first time in my life. Again, a very famous story is now a very uh, popular movie about the girl with the nine wigs. This is a German girl who at a very young age left home to have fun, go to a different city, and she goes and develops this very, you know, bad cancer. And uh, she was told that, sorry, you know, you, you know th this is, you're going to die in a year's time whether this happens or not. So she said, fine, let me go through the chemotherapy. So the first round of chemotherapy, she loses all her hair, and she's very beautiful. She doesn't can handle this thing, so she goes and buys herself this lovely wig of a very promiscuous blondie. And that is when that existential shift took place, you know. She started behaving like a blondie, you know. That whole month she behaved in that manner. She went for the next chemotherapy, whatever hair had grown fell off again. And she buys this wig of a very serious school teacher, so she lives this one month of a school teacher. And this is a lovely movie. I mean, you must see this girl with the nine wigs. And at the end of, the, of nine months, she was well. She was well, you know. It, it's quite unbelievable. There's another story which was published in the New York Times uh, last year about this Greek guy who was an immigrant from Greece to America uh, where he'd had a very bad accident, so they were, he was sent to America for this surgery. Anyway, he got well, and he started uh, working as a labor. Then he became a contractor, and then many years later, Again, he was handed this diagnosis of lung cancer and told that you have a year to live. And he said, okay, if I have a year to live, then let me go back to my you know, village in Greece. And you know, he went there and all his friends called him. They started, got him a bottle of wine. They did board games. He started a herb garden. He connected with his church. He revived his father's old vineyard. And he was well. And 20 years later, he said, let me go back to the US and find out you know, what, from the doctors what happened. Uh, to uh, my cancer, and apparently, you know, the doctors had died. <laughs> he, he, was, he was still alive. So these are very funny stories, uh, but, uh, you know, these are really true. So the, 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 the points to learn from the spontaneous healing is that, number one, if we have seen somebody getting over a very serious illness, we must believe in it. So number one, we must believe that it is possible. And once we believe in it is possible, number two, we must find a support system. We must find a sympathetic doctor or, or a family who says, I'm with you, I'm gonna support you. Number three, listen to your body. Listen to what your body is telling you. You, you know your body much better than what a doctor does. And you know, your body is not like a, a car where you send to the mechanic and fix it. Number four, you write out a prescription for yourself. You write out what are those things in your life that are making you unwell. And number five, you write a solution to them. And number six, you surrender. You know? So if you follow these rules, these, these, these are the rules that these people have followed. The reason I'm telling you these stories is that all these people had some, something going on in their head, something going on in their minds, which actually uh, you know, cured them. So we must give importance to that. Another thing that deserves mention here is, um, is a, a, a study of over 3,500 patients who had very serious diseases. And this guy followed them up by sending them a questionnaire. They, he said that, you know, there was one incident of spontaneous healing. So when and one thing happens, it's called an incident. When a second case also happened, it's called a 
coincidence. When the third, fourth, fifth, sixth happens, then it becomes a law. In science, it becomes a law. So he sent these guys a very serious questionnaire examining what they were. They were people from different countries, different ethnicity, different diets. Somebody prayed, somebody did not. Somebody did yoga, somebody did not. Somebody took natural medicine, somebody not. So these were the things that were not common among these people. But what was common among these people, number one, they all said that there is this higher mind that is giving me life. Now you may call this higher mind God, or cosmic consciousness, or higher power, or anything, but they all said that this, this is non-material aspect of my life. This non-material aspect of my life, that is inside of me and not out there, which is giving me life. Now there's nothing mystical about this source. This is the same intelligence that pumps, you know, two gallons of blood per minute, 100 gallons of blood per hour, 100,000 times in a day, occupying 60,000 miles of arterial system, and yet it occupies only 3% of my body volume. Are you, are you checking on that? You know, obviously you are not, so there is a higher intelligence that's doing it. Every minute we make 10 million new cells and lose 10 million. You know? Oops, just lost 10 million. Every second in our cells there are 100,000 chemical processes going on. And how many cells do we have in our body? Maybe 70 trillion. Are you keeping a check on that? You know, no? There are thousands of these enzymes from our genes that are coming and are watching my immune system, watching any mutations, protecting me from this and that. No, I, I'm not keeping a watch on that. And if you look at my DNA, if you take out a DNA of one cell and stretch it apart, you know, it's about two feet long. And if you take the DNA of all my cells, it will go up to the sun and back 150 times. But if you take the DNA of every human being in this world, it will fit on the head of a pin. Now they realized that they were not in control. They realized that this, there was this greater mind whose mind is greater than mine, whose will is greater than my will, whose love for life is greater than the love for my life. And if I can match, if my mind can match his mind, if my will can match his will, if my love for life can match his love for me, then maybe he will take over. Maybe I should just step aside. So see, they started developing a relationship with this higher mind. They started contacting this higher mind. They realized they had lost touch with this higher power due to their thoughts and actions. And if they reestablished that contact back with this higher power, they would be healed again. This is what they said. You know, this is, that's number one. Number two, they all were convinced that it were their thoughts that affected their bodies. They, 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 they didn't say that my father didn't love me or my wife left me or I am a woman therefore I am a single person or my this or my that. They didn't say all that. They said it is my thoughts that have made me and my reactions and my actions to these thoughts that ha have made me like this. You know, and, and this, this thing that I told you about, you know, thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking and feeling and thinking and they all lived in this cycle all these times and they realized that it was this 20 years of hatred and this 10 years of anger and this 15 years of suffering that has caused by this thing. So they said, I must stop thinking like that. That was number two. Number three, they all decided to reinvent themselves. They all sat down and said, I'm going to become a new me. I'm going to change. What does it mean to be happy? What does it take for me to be happy? What did, why did I react in certain ways? Who do I know in, 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 in history who I can copy, you know? They all started doing new things. They became new people. And that is when this mental rehearsal comes up again. That they mentally rehearsed becoming that new them. That was number three. Number four, they said that while they were doing this mental rehearsal, they just lost sense of space and time. They just got lost. In, in that. And in that time that they got lost, they became some new people. And the fifth thing that they said, that they all wrote and journaled their feelings on a daily basis. Now, when I write my feelings, quantum physics has shown us that, you know, uh, matter and energy are the same. Matter here refers to body and energy here refers to thoughts. So if I write my feelings down, I'm actually, the, they, they lose their power over me. You know, I, the, the power that my thoughts have over me, they go out. Things in my subconscious will come up. And I can always go back to what I wrote on Tuesday and say, hey, I need not have reacted like this. So they all actually journal their feelings on a daily basis.